Hello, everybody. My name is Nate. If I haven't met you, it's good to be together. Glad you're here. Hey, uh, in particular, if you are um, maybe just searching, uh, we call it sometimes we're spiritual and resolved. We're not sure what we believe. Um, thanks for tuning in or thanks for showing up because we know it took a lot of courage to do that. And I just want you to know this. We want something for you, not something from you. Okay, so we want an environment where you can explore who Jesus is and make a decision. Um, you're not a commodity. We don't want something from you. So here's our series we've been working on uh, throughout the year. This book, a most widely read, most influential, most published, most everything book. Um, we're looking at some of these beautiful themes that flow through its multiple thousand years of existence. 44 different authors, and yet, by the way, did you know God was a literary genius? <laughs> um, through all these cultures and three different languages, God weaves these themes, things that are so important for us to know. So we're looking from beginning to end at these major themes, threads. Now, one of the unique things about this weekend is we're going to do something that's a little uh, atypical. Most of the time we can find the thread. It begins in the Old Testament and travels its way through. This week, that won't be the case. We're going to talk about rabbis and disciples, rabbis and disciples, which ends up being this tremendous emphasis in the New Testament and at the very core of Jesus' philosophy on how he's going to do things. But those two terms are not found in the Old Testament. So let me give you a little bit of a history on the concept of rabbis and teachers. Let's define the terms. A rabbi is often just translated into English as teacher, teacher. Disciple, Greek word is mathetes, and that means a follower or one who pursues a rabbi and learns from the teacher. So here's how this developed in Jewish culture. It was fairly peculiar. It didn't happen in other cultures. Israel, the Jewish people were probably more disrupted than any other people on the face of the earth. They were invaded. They were occupied. And then they were sometimes exiled. Forced groups of people moved out of the nation um, regularly. Like this just happened regularly. We live in a nation where we've got incredible security. I mean, could you imagine that on average every 60, 70 years, another nation invaded us, overwhelmed us, occupied us, took huge groups of us away to live in other countries? Well, that's just how the Jewish people existed. And in 586, there was this really disruptive event where the Babylonian Empire comes in. So 586 BC invades the country, decimates the population, and destroys the temple, the temple to Yahweh, the Hebrew name for God. It destroyed it. And so the culture is in upheaval. And then persecution comes. The Assyrians come in. People are exiled. People are taken away. And so now, and from that point on, 586 on, you have groups of Jewish people who have either run for their lives or have been taken through a process of slavery to other parts of the world. So you have pockets of Jewish people who have a very distinct culture and they have a very distinct way of worshiping gods and they didn't, they didn't assimilate into the other cultures religiously. They, they kept their distinction. So in what we call Russia today, there's Jewish people. Um, what we call Turkey today, what we would call Germany today, there's these groups of Jewish people. And so their question was, without a temple, far from our homeland, how do we keep our distinctives and how do we help the next generations learn what it means to be a follower of Yahweh? So what emerged was rabbis. They said, so... You're off in what we call Russia today. So you found someone in your community. Maybe there were three, 400 Jewish people living there. And you said, this person could best teach us and our succeeding generations how to understand the ancient Hebrew scriptures. And so your rabbi, your teacher would educate the children, would educate the adults. And then here's what a rabbi ultimately did. Is an, a rabbi was always looking and scanning keeping their eyes open for the best and for the brightest because they chose to have disciples. So there are rabbis, Hillel, Gamaliel, who this rabbi was exceptional, would pick 
a couple of disciples, probably one or two a year, and pass off their knowledge. And this knowledge then would be, it would go for generations. And this is, this is what it looked like for a rabbi to choose a disciple. A rabbi's educated all the children, and the rabbi's been watching and observing. And somewhere in your early teens, um, as most people entered into the workforce, the rabbi would pick one or two people, and he would say, this is the person. These are the two people I want to be my disciple. So the rabbi would come to the door, usually around dinner time when he knew everybody would be there. And there's no explanation. It's simply this. Knock, knock, knock. Whoever opens the door, oh, there's rabbi. And this is little Bobby's rabbi, right? And all, all, all the rabbi would do is simply look at little Bobby and go follow me. And your obligation was that if you were going to follow the rabbi, you left immediately. You didn't like give mom and dad a kiss goodbye. You didn't like gather all your stuff. The rabbi turned around after saying, follow me and left and would not look back. And it was completely incumbent upon you on whether or not you would follow the rabbi. Now it was a great honor. And if you chose to follow the rabbi, here was your job. It's for the next 10 years, approximately 10 years. Your job was to pursue the rabbi. And it's not just about proximity. You would help, but you would absorb and you would learn. And the hope was that one day you became the teacher and you would find disciples. And so this is how the Jewish tradition, the understandings of the Old Testament were passed on from generation to generation to generation. Now Jesus is born into this culture and Jesus is early on known as a rabbi, a teacher, but an atypical rabbi. As far as we know, Jesus never had a rabbi knock on his door when he was 14 and the rabbi said, follow me. How do we know this? Well, Jesus is described as a tecton, tecton, um, which means he's a, 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 somebody who works with his hands. He, he's a laborer. A lot of times people think it's a carpenter, but if you go to Israel, there's really no wood. They don't make anything out of wood. They never did in the past, but they're stonemasons. You carve things out of stone. So Jesus wasn't asked by a rabbi to follow him, but at 30 years old, 30 years old, Jesus begins to publicly teach. And the people, the religious establishment is absolutely confounded because Jesus hasn't followed the prototypical system of becoming a rabbi, but he is teaching and people are in awe. That word is used over and over, especially in the book of Luke. They're in awe that this Rabbi Yeshua, Rabbi Jesus, was talking about God in a way that no one else ever had. He's not following the traditions. He's opening up the scriptures and there's this enlightenment and there's this passion, there's this growth. And before long, you have thousands of people. You have multiple times where there's crowds in the tens of thousands pushing forward to hear Rabbi Jesus. Jesus, at a point in his life early on, he only taught from 30 years old to 33 years old, finds 12 people, 12 young men. And kind of the fascinating thing is it doesn't appear that any of these young men were asked by any of the modern rabbis to follow him. Because he finds a couple that are fishermen and one that's an accountant, he's a tax collector. And he says the words that rabbis had always said. He says, follow me. And 12 people follow Jesus. And those 12 people, he invests three years of his life. He walks with them. He spends the day with them. It, like they, they live life together. And these 12 people are eventually going to change the world. So here's what I'd like to do. Just talking about rabbis and disciples. How does it apply to your mind, to your life? Um, First, I want to talk about the theology of discipleship or the context. The, the, what does it actually mean, the concept of discipleship? I'm going to push a little bit on some of our, the Western way we do church, okay? But uh, like I'm pointing the finger back at me as much as anybody. So here's the concept of discipleship. Is that this idea of following Rabbi Jesus and of investing your life into others is really at the core of everything Jesus came to do. Did you know that Jesus 
never wrote a document, never ran for a political office, never had an internet campaign. He never, we, we don't think he ever traveled more than 70 or 80 miles from the tiny little village he was born in. He never made a trip to Rome to influence the most powerful empire in the world. He never said, hey, you know what I'm going to do is I need to infiltrate Rome and change Rome. He never did any of these things. The thing that he did that changed the world was to make disciples. It's to invest his life in 12 people who then invested their lives into other people. So you could take everything about the church. Um, You could take our buildings. You could take our leadership structure. You could take away this country we live in where we have freedom of religion. You could take all of that away, which has happened throughout human history, under totalitarian governments, under oppressive governments that persecute. You could uh, determine that no longer can you meet your buildings torn up. You know why Christianity has thrived for 2,000 years? Because what is absolutely essential and at the core is this idea of interpersonal one-on-one discipleship. The church would thrive even if we were told we could never meet publicly again. Because discipleship is what changed the world. Let me, let me talk about this for just a moment. So these 12 people, Jesus says, go and make disciples. They go out and make disciples. And did you know at the end of 300 years, 300 years, of disciples making disciples. The most powerful empire the world had ever seen, the Roman Empire, that celebrated death and violence, bows its knee officially to the teachings of Rabbi Jesus. And they say this, let's not feed people to lions any longer as a form of entertainment. Because that opposes the teachings of Rabbi Jesus. So you have this tiny little place called Israel, which is the backwaters of the Roman Empire. They often sent people there to govern Israel as a form of punishment. Because it was like, like you're in obscurity if you're like Pontius Pilate. He was the governor of Israel. It was probably punishment that he ended up there. Okay, And so... From this obscure part of the Roman Empire, one rabbi, Yeshua, who had never been to the proper schools, begins to teach and preach, and he begins to make disciples. And you give it 300 years, and the Roman Empire says this, we're going to abandon the ancient gods that have taught us to celebrate violence. We're going to abandon our old ways of thinking. We're going to choose the teachings of Jesus, which said that human life is important and it's sacred simply because it's made in the image of God. And the entire empire is changed through the process of discipleship. Up until 280 AD, we do not know of a single Christian church that was built. The church was never dependent on structures. It was never dependent on leadership hierarchy. It thrived, even during times of persecution, because of discipleship. That's the concept, the theology of discipleship. I want to take a moment and let's let's really look at this. What does discipleship mean? Because it's, it's a little bit esoteric when I even say that word. So let's take a few moments and let's talk about the essence of discipleship. We're going to look at one passage of scripture, Matthew chapter 28. This is the very last dialogue that Jesus has with his disciples, his followers, before he ascends into heaven. And this is like your last words, right? This is a big moment. And so Jesus looks at them and we're going to slowly walk through the text so we can really pick out what's the essence of discipleship. Jesus says this, Matthew chapter 28, then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So Jesus The initiator of the church, this thing is built on his life, death, uh, his resurrection. says, now I have authority to establish something here on planet earth, a new kind of kingdom, and this is how I'm going to do it. Okay, this is Jesus' authority in action. So he says, therefore, because I have authority, go and make disciples of all nations. Let's talk about each one of these elements. The first word is go. 
Discipleship, if you want to understand it, at its core, it is about initiation. It is about moving forward. It would have been so easy for these initial disciples who felt incredibly threatened by the Jewish religious establishment that had just sent Jesus to the cross to say, hey, we have this unique thing. The best thing we can do is protect it. Let's move out of town. Let's go into the countryside and we'll just be like disciples of Jesus together. And Jesus says, if you want to understand discipleship, it's not about hiding. It's about initiating. It's about introverts and extroverts looking across the room and saying, that person looks broken and lonely. And I am going to go. I'm going to initiate. I'm going to move forward. It's not about cloistering. It's not about self-protectionism. It is about movement forward, initiating relationship. Go and make disciples. Make followers of Jesus. So the word make tells us there is a process involved. Discipleship does not happen overnight. For me, it's been like a 40-some year process of discipleship. And I keep following and I keep learning and I keep being amazed by what's in me and how marvelous God is. God, I'm still following. I'm still following. Now, here's, here's where we kind of, I think we get it a little bit wrong. We make disciples. We make disciples. We do not make converts. So in Western Christianity, we have, I don't know if it's intentional or unintentional, but we, we just fall prey to this, is we divide up this whole idea of becoming a follower of Jesus into a moment of conversion and a moment of disciple, right? And so even when we introduce Jesus, we talk about eternity. We talk about repenting of your sins, turning to him and securing your eternity with him. So that's this conversion. The Bible talks about being born again, all these beautiful and very true things. But then here's what we do. We go, and then like once, once eternity is taken care of and you're going to heaven, if you're interested, there's this little add-on called becoming a disciple. So we bifurcate conversion and discipleship. And you will not find the New Testament ever doing that. Jesus says, I, I don't want you to go in all the world and make converts. I want you to go into all the world and make mathetes, make people who follow Rabbi Jesus, who abandon whatever it is, who are called by name, follow me, and they pursue Jesus. So this is the mission of the church. Um, what does the church exist for? Uh, my first ministry assignment, my wife will remember this. We worked at this amazing church in Eugene, Oregon. We planted a church down at the University of Oregon and, uh, our senior pastor said, hey, let's go through a time where we clarify our vision. And we came up with a mission statement. I still remember it to this day. This is like 30 years later. To work with Jesus Christ, to see people saved, healed, empowered, and mobilized for kingdom service in the home, the church, and the civic community. And like we had to memorize it, right? And that's our mission of our church. So then the first time I became the senior pastor of a church, I was like, oh, man, we need a mission statement. What are we going to do? I spent nine months. I read every mission statement out there. I would try things like, we've got to word craft it. It's got to be memorable and inspiring. And after nine months, I just couldn't come up with anything. And then I read the Bible. <laughs> and I realized, wait a minute. <laughs> the mission of the church is incredibly clear. And it, it doesn't need to be glossed up. The church exists and has always existed simply to make disciples. So let's go make disciples. So this is the core. Internally, when we have meetings talking about what happens in the future, it's all centered around this. How do we help make followers of Jesus? People who say, he's my rabbi, I follow, and I help make other disciples. So you go into all the world and you make disciples. Here's the next essence of discipleship of all nations. All nations. So Jesus says this to a group of people. Most of his disciples were from Galilee, which was the poorest region in all of Israel. They never traveled. He looks at them and he says, I want you to go 
to all nations, the whole world. Now, if you were a Jewish disciple of Jesus, this phrase right here would have been completely foreign and terrifying to you. Because here's what you were taught as a Jew. You were taught that the rest of the world, and you, you divided up everybody. Jews and the rest of the world were Gentiles. And Gentiles, they were pollutants. They were, they were offensive. If you were involved in a business deal and you had to work with a non-Jew, you know what you had to do after that meeting? You had to go and ceremonially wash your body to get the influence of the non-Jew off of you. And Jesus looks at these Hebrew men and he says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go make disciples of all nations. So for those of us, maybe uh, we hear things about the Bible and a lot of times they're terribly inaccurate. I want to tell you, you can verify this yourself. The Christian church, the dis original disciples of Jesus were the most multicultural group of people you could ever imagine because the early disciples actually took this seriously. It didn't matter what the color of someone's skin was, what language they spoke, what gods they had worshiped in the past. It didn't matter if they were male or female, if they were rich or they were poor, or in the Roman world, a slave or a free person. The early churches were literally filled with every demographic you could ever imagine because no longer did it matter where you came from and who your parents were. What mattered is that you were a disciple, a follower of Jesus. And this ragtag group of people from all walks of life got together. And they took this so seriously. We know about the Apostle Paul who becomes a disciple of Jesus. In the ancient, like the first century world, he travels through the known globe at the time on three to four different missionary journeys. We don't know about everyone else, but church history says this. One of the original disciples named Thomas ends up in India where he is martyred. He's killed for his faith. How in the world, <laughs> this is doubting Thomas, by the way, how in the world do you take a young man named Thomas who speaks the Hebrew language, which no one else in the whole Roman Empire spoke, and he takes these words so seriously that he ends up in what we call India today. This is the essence of discipleship baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. There are so many things that Jesus could have said, this is what you have to do, okay? This is what you have to do. You have to like <clears throat> sign this contract on how you'll behave from this point forward, all that. Jesus said, here's gonna be our initiation rite. When you make disciples, it's gonna be this unique thing that we just saw. How many people like... You look your best right when you come up out of water, <laughs> right? <laughs> like, oh no, that shirt's sticking to lumps. And you know, like Jesus said, Here, here's going to be the initiation into this, this family is for 2,000 years in every part of the globe from filthy ponds to rivers to warm, heated baptismals. People are going to stand in front of crowds of people. And they're gonna say this, I am choosing to be a follower, a disciple of Rabbi Jesus. And he's knocked at my door and I'm responding and I will follow him wherever he goes and I will join him on his mission of restoring justice and peace and love to this planet. And just so that everybody knows it, watch this. I'm gonna go under water and it's going to be in the name of the Trinitarian God. And around here, we whisper in people's ears. You can hear it. You have been buried with Christ. The old you is, is gone. And you have been raised to new life, baptizing them. There are a million things that Jesus could have told us to do. But he says, that's the big one. Let's move on. The essence of discipleship. And teaching them to obey. Okay. We, like this one we have to talk about. I bet a bunch of you who've been around it all, you've been in a discipleship process, right? We have thousands of the process. They're all beautiful. I like them. I'm not speaking against them. But what we do in our Western world where we are, we emphasize teaching. And so we decide that discipleship is this. Here's what you need to do. 
You need to uh, memorize these scriptures that are essential. You need to memorize this doctrine. This is essential. You need to know that this is wrong. And so we're really heavy on the intellectual part of discipleship. I, I love the intellectual part of discipleship. I'm not disparaging it. It's very, very important. But what we're missing is the next part. <laughs> you teach them to what? To be able to win Bible trivia every time. No, that's not the goal of discipleship. Is that if you're watching Jeopardy and there's a Bible category, you're like, oh, oh, oh I'm, gonna, I'm gonna win, I'm gonna win. All teaching is meant so that people can obey. Because information, as beautiful as it is, will never save anyone. And it will never transform anyone. But you know how lives are transformed? As I'm taught, to obey the words of Jesus. Example, intellectually. I've learned that in Matthew 18, Jesus gives this beautiful discourse on how to deal with interpersonal conflict with other people. Okay, I know it, I know the steps. But here's the challenge. I could know the steps, and yet here's what my body, my instincts, my old person, my old man tells me to do. My old person says, lash out, gossip, get even. The goal of discipleship is to teach people to step towards this and say, okay, not only do I know what Jesus says, but I am choosing to obey and I'm going to do conflict differently than the world does it. I am going to learn how to love enemies. I'm going to learn how to forgive when everything inside of me says, don't forgive. It's teaching to obey. The point is this. It's not just, hey, I, I went through conversion. I believe all the right things. Jesus says, no, a disciple has their life transformed. They act differently. They think differently. They value differently. I teach them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And here's the last part of the essence of discipleship. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. This whole idea of discipleship is this. This is what Jesus wants his disciples to know. You are not a disciple of a dead man. You, you, you will not be following this historical figure who impacted Israel so significantly. He says, no, no, no. This discipleship process, God himself is engaged in it. It's not this religious practice that I have to figure out. He says, I'm gonna be, I am gonna be with you every step of the way. I'm gonna help teach you how to obey. I'm gonna guide you, I'm gonna do something through my spirit, I'll begin to transform even your desires so that you come more in alignment with your rabbi Jesus. He is with us, it's not historical, it is current. Jesus is resurrected and working in the midst of his church. Okay, the essence of discipleship. Now, okay, th those are, that's a, that's a little bit esoteric at times. I wanna take a couple of moments, my last few minutes, and I want to talk just practically about this. What does this look like in everyday life? If discipleship is truly Jesus' plan to transform the world, well, what do we do it? How, what, how do we apply it today in 2022? Like, what does this look like? So here's a practical step that in my life has been very, very beneficial. I'm going to talk to you about developing a healthy constellation of relationships. Okay, healthy constellation of relationships. So, uh, this represents you, okay, and me, everyone, it represents you. And we have relationships, right? They're all around us. And it seems like there are three main types of relationships. Here's the first type of relationship. This is the most natural. Uh, for some of us, it's very, very natural. There's these lateral relationships. These are... Friends. Okay, now some of you are extroverts and you have like clusters and clusters and clusters and clusters of friends. I don't know how you maintain all those, but good for you. Guys, a lot of us really struggle with this. Um, I'll ask guys a lot. Do you have any friends? Oh, yeah, there's like a, a guy we went to high school together. We talk every four or five years. That's your best friend, 
right? But these, these relationships are important. They're important just socially to keep us thriving and alive. And you need those. I need those. This is part of why Jen and I are in small groups. We just need people who will walk with us. Now, there's two more aspects to relationships. There are these relationships of people who oftentimes are a little bit older or wiser. See, I can't ever think that I stop being a disciple. There's always people that I need to learn from. And, and here's the beauty of these relationships. Because they're not just lateral, these relationships provide accountability. These relationships provide instruction and they tend to be much more honest than these relationships. <laughs> I'll give you, give you an example. Jesus is speaking to his disciple, Peter. And Peter has this whole agenda for Jesus' life. And you know what Jesus says to him? He looks at Peter, he goes, get behind me, Satan. How would you like to be called a little Satan by Jesus? Like that is not complimentary. But what is happening there? Peter has an agenda that's wrong. And so Jesus, as the discipler goes, man, that, what you're thinking right now, that is from the pit of hell. And I'm going to acknowledge it because I need you, Peter, to think differently. So these relationships are very, very important. I'm looking at some of you who are veterans. You've been around. And you don't even know, like, I don't know if I have anything to offer. Just invite some people into your life. You have something to offer. You have honesty. You have perspective. But there's one more element to these healthy relationships, having a healthy constellation of relationships. These are people that I am investing my life in. This is what changed the world. People investing in you, investing disciples, making disciples. Now, there's a challenge with this. There's a challenge with this. Here's an example. Jesus is walking through a crowd. There's people pressing in all around. There's a woman in the crowd who has an ongoing hemorrhage. She's been bleeding for over a decade. No doctors have been able to fix her. She creeps through the crowd. She reaches out and touches Jesus. Jesus stops and he looks at his disciples and he says, who just touched me because I felt power flow out of me. And the disciples are like, everybody's touching you. Like this is a massive crowd. And the lady goes, it was me. It was me. In this type of relationship, something flows from you. You do not get involved in this relationship for yourself. This isn't like the most, oh, you know, I, I can't wait to go golfing with the guys I'm discipling. Because in this relationship, something from you is flowing into other people. It's this ongoing investment. So how do we have a balanced relationship? Well, some of us, you just need some friends, okay? Go do that. <laughs> some of us, we have people that we're pouring our lives into. I mean, this could be your children or your teacher, whatever it is. And if you don't have anybody that's investing in your life, you know what ends up happening? You get angry, <laughs> you feel exhausted, you, you, you resent people, okay? So you got to have this input in your life. If, man, you're just a learner and you're asking questions and you got all these people you're learning from, but there's nothing happening down here, you know what this is called, the theological concept for this? It's called spiritual constipation. And your life will not be significant because you're growing, but you're not giving. And so I, I try to take an assessment of my life regularly. I draw this on the, my board in my office and I'm always like, man, I need, I need somebody who can talk to me some truthful language about this. I've got questions about the church. I've got questions about marriage, whatever it might be. And then I want to make sure that I'm a part of the mission of Jesus that is changing the planet by saying, and I'm giving my life away. And this is not all about the transference of information. This is, these are people that I care about and I'm trying to teach them how to obey the way of Jesus. 
and I'm just embracing them into my life. They're going, to, they're going on trips. They're, they're hanging out with me. There's not always an agenda. It's just life-to-life transference. And I don't care what happens politically. I don't care what happens in the world. If this is operating in the church of Jesus, the process of discipleship, the church will thrive and the world will change. I want to end with just one other thought. I want to talk about the power of discipleship. Okay, the power of discipleship. Out of all the things that Jesus could have done, he could have gone to Rome and looked at Caesar and said, Caesar, here's what's going down. You're going to follow me. But he didn't. He, Jesus did not think that was the most effective way to make disciples. Here's what he did. He invested his life in 12 people. So here's the power. This is why Jesus did it. It's the power of multiplication. Here's the assumption. Every one of us invests our life into one person every year. Just one person. And you, like, here it is. Let me do what I can. I am imperfect, and I am following, and I'm learning, but I'm also willing to give and to teach. I'll take a younger generation. I'll take a middle schooler under my wing. I'll take whatever it is. I'll take somebody. I've gone through my own uh, uh, sobriety, and now I'll find somebody who's struggling. I'll help you. You do it one-on-one. Okay, at the end of the year, you have two disciples, right? Well, okay, it's disciples who make disciples. And then the two of you invest your life in another person. What happens? At the end of that year, you've got four. You follow this up in 10 years, meaning one person a year, investing your life in them. There are 512 people who have been discipled. That's that's great. But let me show you the power of discipleship. Here's the next set of numbers. This is at 20 years. If we just do this, this is how the church existed. This is, this is why it exists today. At the end of 20 years, you meeting, investing your life in one person a year, you have 1,048,576 disciples. That is approximately the population of the great state of Montana. If you want to change the world, you could rant and rave on Facebook. Maybe. You you could like take your account, empty it out, and get like billboards and Google ads. Maybe. Or we could do what Jesus did. So here's what I want to do. I want to open up my life. I want to be a disciple. I want to be taught. And I want to teach. I want to pour the little bit I know into someone else's life and teach them how to obey Jesus. And if I did that and they did that, at the end of 20 years, a million people have been impacted. If you had thousands of people who call Faith Chapel their home doing that, you're talking billions. You're talking the ministry, the mission of Jesus being accomplished here on planet Earth. It's not overcomplicated. Let's do what Jesus did.